the elites are looting America. The Democrats' elites are looting America. And uh, this has come in the latest absurd bill that, as you can see here, is literally like a foot long, 250,000 words, uh, pages, sorry, not words, Christ, 250,000 pages, uh, no, 25, uh, yeah, 2,500 pages, sorry, that nobody's read because it's like twice as long as the Bible. And they're like, right, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Like the last one where Pelosi was like, well, we're going to pass it. was it Schumer who said we're going to pass it to see what's in it. Yeah, like, I think that was Obamacare. It was like, yeah. you got to pass it to see what's in it. It's like, that's, that's not how this should work. But uh, clearly they don't care. And they're like, well, if you're okay with the 1.9 trillion COVID relief bill that they passed earlier in the year, uh, if we can go to the next one, John, um, as you can see, it's, this was passed in March, then you may as well, we may as well double that. I mean, let's just let's go three and a half. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Do you remember that guy on, I think it was John Stewart's show, and he was making fun of this Republican, because the Republican was like, just make every bill one page. Mm -hmm. He was like making fun of him for just being like, I don't want to read. Look at what they have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, if an opposition party gave that to you in Britain as like, this is the bill. I'd burn it. You'd have no reason to work with them ever. So, no. right, you're just taking the mickey. Yeah. You yeah. are, I mean, if, if you didn't present this like, you know, six months in advance so our lawyers can read it, go through it, and then address all of the points that you're clearly going to be needed to make, then this is clearly, uh, you're attempting to hoodwink oh, us. Come on, even if you gave that to a lawyer. That's, e that's I know, just cruel. I know. It would, yeah, yes, but you know that's for their sins. But at the end of the day, yeah, the the, the reason they they are doing this is to make it impenetrable, hmm. and they know it, and everyone knows it. It's being done on purpose to fleece you because they think you're sheep, and um, because most of the public are really. But uh, anyway, so what sort of stuff's in it? Well, apparently, some of it's at fifteen million dollars of it is going to people who are under underserved due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Okay. Thanks. So we're going to fund Grinder. <laughs> I, I don't know what the hell else that means. No, I don't know. But anyway, moving on to more sensible coverage, uh, NPR have uh, given some information on it. Uh, so Chuck Schumer has released the text of this 3.5 trillion budget framework, which is meant to give the Democrats the opportunity to approve major federal investments in childcare, family leave, climate change provisions without the support of congressional Republicans. Because at this point, I think they actually do know they're beyond the Rubicon. Right. I, I think the Democrats are well aware that they're pretty unelectable from this point onwards. And so unless they're just going to commit to the continual fortification of every election from here on out, which was probably a lot of work, I don't think they do it every time. Uh, I think they're just going, going for broke, hell for leather, we've crossed the Rubicon, may as well burn it all down, see what happens, unfortunately. Uh, and so, yeah, they're going to be setting up everything in that way. And do you really want them to do this? You know, do you want them to, you know, we're going to have leftist stuff everywhere childcare, family leave, climate provisions. And we don't care what the Republicans have to say about it. And it's like, okay, if that's the case, shouldn't the Republicans not organize some sort of walkout or something? Go and protest, you know, have a session of the plebs yeah, I mean, on the hill on the, the other side or something. So look, we're not just, we're not cooperating with you. You're not cooperating with us. You're deliberately bypassing us. This is unacceptable. We refuse this. The government is over. And that's know. what I would have done in response <clears throat> to be given that bill to yeah. read. They're like, right, no, you're not taking me seriously. You're not yeah. respectable to any kind of politics at all. This is an no autocracy. Yeah, this yeah. isn't politics. This is aut autocracy. Uh, and the fact that you're doing this deliberately to go around us means that you clearly think that you've won some sort of civil war and the Rubicon's crossed and we're, we're, we, ab we abstain, basically. Uh, but anyway, Chuck Schumer says... When we took this majority in the Senate earlier this year, the American people entrusted us with a great responsibility to make their lives better. I'm happy to report we're making great progress towards that goal. You can say that with a straight face. Apparently, the bill contains $726 billion for health, labor, education, and pensions committees, uh, with expansive instructions to address some of their other top priorities, blah, blah, blah. $107 billion for the Judiciary Committee, including instructions to address lawful permanent status for qualified immigrants. Sneak across the border. Not even sneak anymore. You come across the border because Joe Biden's abandoned the border. Well, you get permanent status. $135 billion for the Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. I can't help but think this is going to end up in Lysenkoism 2.0. Uh, but uh, $332 billion for the Banking Committee, including instructions to invest in public housing, housing trust fund, and housing affordability, and equity and community land trusts. I'm sure none of this is going to be wasted. $198 billion for the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, including instructions largely related to clean energy development. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. So the Democrats plan to use special budget rules to pass new spending without the threat of a Republican filibuster in the Senate. Republicans have broadly rejected plans for additional spending, and the Democrats are threatening, uh, they say the Democrats are threatening channels of bipartisan support for other critical economic issues, such as increasing or suspending the debt limit. Uh, well, I guess the debt limit is going to be something we're going to have to talk about at some point if you're going to keep spending trillions of dollars like it's going out of fashion. Uh, to be fair, this is a, a guilty I know, thing of both parties. I know. But the thing is, like, there's one thing going, oh, we're going to have to increase it. Yeah, okay, we're going to increase it. And then there's Joe Biden being like, five billion in one year. Uh, Troy, five trillion in one year. Yeah. I think I will. You know, there's a, there is a distinct difference there. You could argue, yeah. And will argue. Uh, Mitch McConnell uh, said basically the, the Republicans would offer no help on debt limit if the P Democrats pursued more spending. And so Joe Biden was like, ha-ha, like I care about your opinion. Uh, so the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, if we go to the next one, has warned lawmakers that the federal government will likely run out of cash and extraordinary measures by October the 18th, unless Congress raises the debt ceiling. Oh, come on, let's hope so. Let's hope so. I mean, like, you know, run out of money, Joe. Oh, that means I can't spend anymore. Thank God. You know, obviously all bad stuff. But uh, Hugo's done an article talking about this on NoCease.com, why the US government cannot run out of money. Uh, the Obviously, they're not going to. It's going to be that they just uh, don't raise the debt ceiling. Uh, quoting from this, claiming the US government will run out of money is ridiculous. Modern monetary theorists are completely correct when, in claiming that a government that issues its own currency can never go broke on paper. They can always create, brackets, print new money in order to cover obligations that it has in currency. So if that runs out, it's just a declaration of the unwillingness to print more for some internal reason, as we can see. Uh, of course, money creation dilutes the purchasing power of all of this currency already in circulation, making everyone poorer in a massive daylight robbery. That's what Joe Biden is doing. That's what the Democrats are doing. They are looting from you. Uh, if a central bank or the government does it too much, the currency will be destroyed and the country will be cast into hyperinflationary turmoil and impoverishment. But from the point of view uh, of the government, the fact that it can manipulate money like this is great. It can do whatever it wants as long as people are willing to trust it and go along with its shenanigans. Because that's what this is about. This is all based on trust. And Joe Biden is just like, right, okay, trillions more. Trillions more. It means such a large amount of money... I'm not even going to try and describe how much money it is. You may just think of it as infinite money, because they do, right? Because Pelosi literally thinks this is going to cost you nothing. Three and a half trillion. Oh, it's the net, net cost of this is zero. What even is that zero? Can't even make a zero properly. Can't even do a proper Polish zero. Oh. Disgraceful. She's probably signaling to white supremacists or something. But uh, she says, you know, it's, it's not about a dollar amount. The dollar amount, as the president said, is zero. And so it's like Corbyn's plans, totally absurd, right? And even Newsweek had to publish an article going, hang on, Pelosi, you lunatic, shut up. Because and they, if you can go to the next one, the Newsweek actually did a really good job of explaining why these people think this way, right? So it's just like Corbyn, where they, you know, do you remember his, uh, his plan? Like, oh, no, it's totally costed. It's totally costed. Here's the money. <laughs> exactly. It's good. This is what we're going to spend. This is how we're going to get it. And uh, everyone was like, look, if you just try and fleece the rich, they'll leave. And you won't get the money in returns that you're expecting. There's actually an economic term for it. I'm not, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But uh, there's Capital a flight. No, 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 yeah, that's what will happen. But there's a particular economic term for the sort of the formula of what you actually get back. You know, you're expecting this much, but you actually get this much. And there's a formula you can use for it. I don't know. Uh, I'm not an economist, but it's not very complex, frankly. But uh, they say in here, and this is really great, right? To understand how the government works, look no further than the assertion by both President Joe Biden and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And the Democrats plan spend over $3.5 trillion over the next year, uh, 10 years, which will cost zero dollars, Right. Both of them have spent 80 years combined in Washington, and concepts like how much something costs have a very specific, if peculiar, definition. To Washington lawmakers, adjustments to the federal budget, whether a tax cut or a spending increase, only cost something if it isn't paid for. That is to say, yes, the government will be spending a lot more, but it's okay because we will increase taxes in sufficient amounts to cover the cost of all that new spending. So if you look at the spreadsheet, if you uh, do your Excel calculations... This is why they think it costs zero. Net, net difference, zero. It'll cost the government zero. It'll cost you plebs. Oh, yeah. Three trillion. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's not our problem. It, yeah, exactly, right? And, uh, and what I love about this article, they're like, so look, setting aside for a moment whether this is actually true, spoiler alert, it isn't, and consider the mindset. As long as the government revenue increases by as much as the government is spending, the effect on the federal budget will be nil, and thus the legislation doesn't cost anything. In the real world, of course, no one believes this kind of thinking or acts on it. Yes, that's it. 
in the real world, no one believes this or acts like they do. Right? And so basically what they've said is, well, we're only going to be taxing people who make more than $400,000 a year. And so it's just their personal taxes that will go up. But uh, that's not going to be how it works. <clears throat> But CNN are doing their due diligence as an organ of the Democratic Party, going, well, hang on a second, 90% of tax households won't see a bigger tax bill under Biden's $3.5 trillion plan. Oh, that's very reassuring. If it's said on CNN, it must be true. Well, they could, ha they have two options. They could tax you more, or they could just print the money. And if you print the money, you tax people through interaction. Yes, you do, which we will get to in a minute. But I love, I love the way they frame this, right? So many economists assume, for example, that an increase in the corporate tax rate, rate will, ins will result in lower wages for workers, and other elements like higher tax on cigarettes would disproportionately affect low- and middle-income households. They just assume it, do they? Okay. Roughly 90% of households went and see a tax increase during the first year of the plan. Oh, and in fact, they will see that after-tax incomes go up, according by an analysis by the right-leaning tax foundation. Yeah, okay, maybe. Maybe. Let's, let, that might be true. That might be completely true. I mean, you know, that's what happens when you're going into massive amounts of inflation. Because it turns out that, as you uh, looked up in July, uh, things are getting really expensive in America. In fact, they hit like an all-time high on fuel prices. We can get to the next one. CNN again reporting, uh, hmm, everything's getting more expensive. So you might have <clears throat> like, you know, an extra $100 a month, but your fuel, food, fuel, and energy costs will have gone up by like $300. Thanks, Biden. You know, thank you very much. So it's not the government's fault. It's not that's, the, that's the corporations putting those prices up. We we assume Scrap. they won't transfer those costs on to the consumer for some reason. Don't know why they think that. But uh, yeah, so apparently uh, in July, consumer prices increased four point three percent in one in the twelve month period ending July, slightly lower than June's overall increase, which was five point four percent. Brilliant. Weirdly, hot dogs saw the biggest price jump at four point eight percent. Pork roast, steak and ribs, 4.4. Uh, compared to this time last year, petrol was more than 41% more expensive. People don't need petrol, do they? It's a gas in America. No, I know, but I'm not saying that. Right. But they, they, they've mean, got their liquid. horses and carts, haven't they? And these peasants got feet. Can't they walk places? Oh, no, America's massive. You have to have a car in America. Unbelievable. And the public transport's abominable. So uh, anyway, Marco Rubio has come out and been like, well, this is Marxism. And they were all like, ha, 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 how's that Marxism? It's like, what do you mean, how's that Marxism? I mean, you're literally saying we hate the rich and we're going to take their money and we're going to you know, spend it on what we consider to be the poor. Redistributive. The exactly. So, yeah. I mean, the, the very lens you're looking at this through, how can we attack those wealthy people because they must be illegitimate by virtue of them being wealthy? That is what Marxism is. He's not saying it's collective ownership of the means of production. He didn't say it was communism, which is what everyone's taking that to mean, because everyone's they're, they're, they're honestly, they're all like, well, Rubio's engaging in political hyperbole, blah, 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 blah. You know, this isn't communism or socialism. No, but it is Marxism. They're looking at this through a Marxist lens, suggesting that the rich, by virtue of being rich, are oppressing the poor, and therefore it's justified to take their money. That is a Marxist framework. That is the Marxist lens. And uh, weirdly enough, Biden's um, choosing someone to be the comptroller of currency, and the person he's chosen appears to be a Soviet lunatic. We can go to the next one, John. It was reported by Zero Hedge. Biden's pick for comptroller of currency is quite the anti-capitalist. Cornell Law University professor, again, Law University professor, why that person? Saul Omarova who proposed ending banking as we know it, and a radical change to the system would make the institution more inclusive, efficient, and stable. What? Until I came to the US, I couldn't imagine that things like the gender pay gap still existed in today's world. Say what you like about the old USSR, there was no gender pay gap there. Is that true, Callum? No. <laughs> You remember the, uh, there's a section in Mao's uh, Great Famine we yeah. did in which they literally like they went as far in China as to make communes and they got rid of money and mm -hmm. they declared was it work points mm -hmm. and then the women still got underpaid by work points. <laughs> I never claimed women and men were absolutely treated equally in every facet of Soviet life, but people's salaries were set by the state in a gender blind manner, all, and all women got very generous maternity benefits. Both things are still a pipe dream in our, in our society. Tell me and more. Hang on, hang on, that's true. But 
the rate of women eating their own children out of starvation is much lower in the United States. Mm. As the Wall Street Journal editorial board noted, uh, Ms. Amarova thinks asset prices, pay scales, capital and credit should be dictated by the government. In two papers, she has advocated expanding the Federal Reserve's mandate to include price levels of systematically important financial assets as well as worker wages. Uh, so literally she wants the government to tell everyone how much they get paid. Brilliant. Uh, as they like to say in the modern university, from each according to her, her ability to each according to her needs. There's Lenin's dictum there. That's nice. She also wants to create a public interest council of highly paid academics, quote highly paid, she said that, uh, who would wield subpoena power over regulatory agencies, including the Fed. Federal Reserve. Like, do you want a group of managerial elites who are being paid a huge amount to have complete control of the state and therefore all over, over all of society? It's just commissars. Exactly. I certainly don't. That sounds awful. Why would this lunatic even want any of these things? Well, if we look at a Wikipedia bio, it turns out she was born and raised in the Soviet Union. <laughs> I'm joking. She graduated from Moscow State University in 1989 on the Lenin Personal Academic Scholarship and moved to the United States in 1991, where she decided to try and recreate the Soviet oh, Union. Right, so she moved because the Soviet Empire collapsed, yes. not because she defected, either. No. no, she's not a defector. She's disappointed that the USSR collapsed. And, you know, you can say, you say what you want about it, but at least they didn't have James pay gap, Callum, even though they did. Everyone ate their own children together. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's very progressive. But uh, anyway, so what else is in there? Well, you've got the term birthing people no in fact you can go to the next one they don't have the term birthing people uh that's not included it's now birthing individuals because so we not even people now being offensive to people we didn't include insects i assume the lizards among us I, uh... dogs and cats i don't know <laughs> like I, like the the this individual that's given birth uh, anyway, so moving on just very quickly, just to include some more batty stuff that the Biden administration has done to prove that they're clearly legitimate and loved by the people in general. Uh, the Biden's education secretary has uh, recently been asked a few questions that were very interesting. Uh, who's who's the person who owns your kids and who's the, sorry, the primary stakeholder in your children and their education? See what I mean? I no, it's stakeholder. Language. It's the worst thing in the world. Well, it's corporate language. Mm. It's, it's a deeply corporate language. Uh, and okay, so we're going to have to use this dehumanizing corporate language. Uh, at least I am the primary stakeholder in my kids' education. I might know, not according to this guy. He was like, "Well, you're important, but," and he just dodges the question. They are important, he, but he is the primary stakeholder in your child. Yes, in your child and your child's education. They think that the government owns your children, and they think the government owns you, and they want to be able to set your wages. They want to be able to literally just tax you as much as they want and then piss your money away on any ideological project that they have. Funding grinder. Um, yeah, funding grinder. <laughs> uh, it, and it's wild. And contemporaneously, contemporaneously to all of this, there was, if you can post the next one, um, this, this picture just went around. In fact, follow me on Getter as well, by the way. Uh, but uh, this picture just went around. And this is amazing, right? So Biden got his like third boost, you know, booster shot to the COVID vaccine. And it's just embarrassing. Look at it. Fake White House, fake stage, fake windows. Fake. I'm sure the booster shot was real, though. I'm sure it wasn't saline or anything. Uh, you know, totally real. But, uh, but like, you know, totally real is getting the jab. And then, of course, PolitiFact were like, well, hang on, hang on a second, hang on a second. This isn't, it, it, it isn't fake news. Okay, it may have been a fake set, but it wasn't for the booster. They'd used this fake set before. So don't you worry. <laughs> they say, our research uncovered no evidence that the White House intended to mislead anyone by using the windows and white columns background. Well, sorry, why would they be doing it if it's not to mislead people, right? The backdrop had already been used in one of official event five days before Biden received his booster shot. Oh, so that's okay. We've used this fake set before. We're not lying to you. Don't worry. And when you catch us lying, say, so yeah, we do this all the time. Don't worry about it. So yeah, the absolute state of the Biden administration. Looking forward to the hyperinflation. I wonder how many more trillions they're going to have to print till hyperinflation hits. Got a, got a, a guess? Should you put a number on it? Let's have a th in the chat. Put a number on it. Tell me how you how many trillions more do you think they're going to have to print before the US goes into rampant hyperinflation and the economy is completely liquidated? 
If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast, The Lotus Eaters, you can catch the full podcast at 1pm every weekday UK time at lotuseaters.com. You can also sign up at lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site. Yeah, that's how we keep this whole operation running. And recently we've put up loads of great stuff, such as this interview with legendary comedian Steve Hughes, one of my personal favourite comedians. So it was a real honour to be able to meet him. But what one thing that I didn't expect that he would be such a deep thinker. And this, honestly, this podcast is genuinely like... A meeting of minds in a way. He was right on my wavelength on a bunch of things and helped me actually connect a bunch of dots, but I'm not going to carry on and spoil it. Uh, we also, of course, have lots of interesting articles that have been written, uh, such as this one by Josh about the dumbest country on earth. And for premium, uh, for silver tier subscribers, uh, we also include a link. So it's uh, we have an audio reading of it from a chap called Jonathan, who has a very smooth voice that uh, you will enjoy. And this is great because often I don't have time to read all of the articles we put up because we've put up a lot of regular content. And so this saves me the hassle of having to read it myself. So I really actually am very appreciative of this feature on a personal level. But uh, we also do the contemplations and epochs, which are just interesting podcasts about interesting things. These are regular weekly podcasts. So this one is uh, one of our writers, Josh, who's a very, he's got a master's degree in psychology, talking about theories of intelligence and how they matter. And uh, of course, we've got the epochs where we, myself and Bo, or in this case, it was Josh and Bo, talking about the life of Sir Francis Drake. So that's two solid hours uh, talking about England's most notorious adventurer. Uh, but we've also got lots and lots of other ones. This is number 21. So there's a, a good back catalogue there. And finally, we have our book clubs. And this is the part that I'm most proud of. Uh, recently, we've done uh, Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell. And, and Reflections on a Ravaged Century by Robert Conquest. Yeah, Robert Conquest is fantastic. Just if you want Western chauvinist historian, he's your man. Anti-socialism. Yes, <laughs> in, in, in all forms. It's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, yeah, and like I said, that's what keeps the podcast running. So if you want to become a member, thank you very much. And we think there's some great stuff you'll enjoy.